Okay, hello folks, Charlie here from Base Miami, and I wanted to welcome you to our video series where we'll be discussing a uh, lot of things related to expansion into the US market. Um, and today we're having a chat with Dan Gretsch. He's the CEO and founder of BizHack. Uh, hi, Dan, thanks so much for being here with us today. Great to be here today. Awesome, and, and Dan, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about what BizHack does, just so our audience can understand? Absolutely. You know, I, I took a few seconds to just prepare a few slides to kind of describe who we are and why we are, uh, who we are, what we do and why we do what we do. Um, and embedded in there are some of the things that we teach other businesses about how to market themselves, uh, including how to find their ideal customer persona, which I know is going to be a topic that we're going to talk about. So um, I wanted to share. So BizHack Academy does digital marketing training for small businesses. Uh, we focus on micro enterprises, folks with small budgets, lean teams, and limited expertise. And I wanted to share with you who we are today. So BizHack over the past seven years, working with 700 different businesses, has developed what we call the lead building system. The lead building system is three elements. It's the foundation. The foundation is your business story. We have the six pillars. These are the six pillars that are gonna be true of any campaign you run, digital or non. Um, and these six pillars are your campaign objective, your target audience or your ideal customer persona, your irresistible offer, your thumb stopping video, a video that will get people who are scrolling on your Facebook feed to stop and watch, your compelling messaging, and then your call to action. And if you get these six pillars right, you will have a successful campaign. If any one of these pillars are weak, your lead building will collapse. And then finally, nine steps are the nine steps that we will take you through in our proven process to get you the results you want. So it took us a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of experimentation to come up with this very concise system, and then to prove it through working with businesses. We talked about the foundation being your business story. And what we have found is when it comes to small businesses, anyone who is incumbent competitors and is very limited in time and expertise, it's incredibly important that you have great clarity on how to tell your business story online. And the foundation of any business story, the, the fundamental element of any business story is your personal motivation for doing what you do. We call this your why. This idea comes out of Simon Sinek. This is a leadership principle that we've now applied to marketing. And my why is for my whole life from when I was a kid, I was taught by my parents to help the underdog so they can thrive. I remember my mother's taught inner city uh, it's taught, taught art in inner city Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And I would go into her inner city schools where a lot of the kids were from very rough upbringings and she created a safe community for learning and for life growth. And I had no idea that fast forward 30 years, I would be running a training academy in digital marketing for small businesses, which is essentially the exact same thing that my mom taught me to do when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. And when I look back on my career and I think about the work I've done as a journalist, I spent um, more than 20 years as a journalist and storyteller. Um, I realized that so much of the work that I did was to cover the underdog. So whether it was the, um, the poor students in the worst performing schools in Florida when I was at the Miami Herald, or if it was covering the poorest of the poor people uh, when I was a foreign correspondent in Latin America for NPR, I always was looking to cover the underdog, not the politician, not the celebrity. So that's been part of my DNA for my whole life. And now when I'm running a business, I could work for the Fortune 500s, but no, I choose to focus on the small business, the startup and the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So um, just a couple other things. So we talked about why we do what we do. Then there's what we do, which is content, coaching and community and how we do it. We teach it through storytelling strategy and software. And we've had 750, 700 businesses go through this program. And the core focus, our core philosophy of how we do this is learn by doing experiential learning and learning from your peers, learning from others. And so that is really the core 
and essence of who we are and how we do it. That's awesome. Uh, then you know that it's, I, I felt related with two things you said, uh, the helping the underdog and the story that, that you told, it's, it's awesome because it's very similar to what we do with Base Miami uh, when we're trying to support, you know that I would say there's always the, the flashy and, and cool entrepreneurs that, you know, they get all the cameras and, and then they are selected for the best uh, accelerator programs and they get money from investors and all this. And then you have the other guys that are, are maybe they're not as shiny and, and as cool, but they're as hard workers and they have the talent and they have the, the experience, but they, they just need maybe that support to kind of, you know, get those first steps in the US. So um, I definitely that's something that same here, like when, I, when we were seeing a lot of Latin entrepreneurs coming to Miami and really not knowing how to move around uh, the ecosystem, that's, that's what Base Miami was created for. So we I think we share a little bit of that why <laughs> and and um, and then what you said about experiential learning is it's super interesting as well because i think that it's the only way is by you know learning by doing and, and making the mistakes and i guess that in your case is okay make sure that you don't make these mistakes that that's what you're teaching right so that's um, right yeah so awesome and congrats for all the all the growth that you've had um in, in the past year so thank you very much and, and you know now now touching to with that specific thing that I mean we you you gave a workshop recently about finding your ideal customer online um, and and we know that a lot of entrepreneurs and organizations struggle with this. Um, I, I'm not sure if if it's more if your focus is only B two C or if you also help B two B companies with this. And and I, I yes, maybe the question is, what would you say is the right approach to finding and understanding uh, th those clients? And if there are any tools that you recommend? using to, to facilitate this process. Absolutely. So uh, we'll start with sort of why it's incredibly important to find your ideal customer online and how um, it might not translate perfectly who your ideal customer is, who you can find online. So let me, let me start by saying the core of marketing is your audience and your offer. You need to find, you need to be talking to the right audience, your ideal customer and you need to give them a compelling offer that will get them to take the next step in your buying journey, to try your product, whatever it is. So the when it comes to audience, um, I, I definitely encourage you to think in terms of your ideal customer. So a lot of folks just look at their customers that they currently have, you know, they have 15 people who are doing work with them and they then analyze who those 15 people are and they develop personas based on that. I would not recommend that. I would recommend rather that you figure out who your ideal customers are and then you go out and find them online. And the more specific you can get about their, their likes, their interests, their age, the more targeted your ad campaigns can be and the more likely you will to be successful. So one of the big insights I would share is don't think in terms of current audience, think in terms of ideal audience. Another way that I like to explain this is if you're gonna go and spend time and money acquiring new customers, why would you wanna acquire anyone but your ideal customer, right? Mm -hmm. Really focus on identifying your ideal customer. Now, oftentimes you can identify your ideal customer by some subset of your existing customers. One of my favorite examples of this is Twitch. Twitch, which is the gaming live streaming service. Um, they actually started out as a service to allow people to live stream their lives 24 hours a day. And so you would be like, you know, Dan's channel. And it would just be like, I'd be wearing live streaming equipment and I would just stream my life. Well, they found that there were some people who were willing to stream their life a la Truman Show, but not that many people who wanted to watch it. But there was this one sub segment of Twitch where they were seeing a lot of success, which was gamers. About 1% of their users were gamers recording their own gaming. And they found that they had a huge audience and a, and a loyal audience. So Twitch, which went through many iterations, figured that was our ideal customer, the gamer. And then they put all of their attention and all of their focus into just serving that community, finding them and serving them. And that's what led them ultimately to become a billion dollar acquisition from Amazon. If they had not had that insight of who their ideal customer was, they would not have succeeded. And oh, by the way, that represented 1% of their user base when they made that decision. So it was a it was, a, it was a combination of analytics, deep thinking, and a little bit of guesswork. You know, they, they 
th th there is a gut element to this when you're an early stage company. And so when you're entering a new market like the United States, it's really important for you to understand that this is a huge economy. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, like if you're um, a marketing agency, for instance, in Argentina, you can do everything. You can do branding, you can do, um, you know, creative, you can do running paid ad campaigns, you can do organic social media, you can do content. And because it's a smaller market and a relatively limited competitive set, and you can do it for all industries, and you can be successful in Argentina doing that. Impossible to do that in the United States. You cannot enter the marketplace of the United States and try to do all things for all people, you will fail. You need to niche down both on what services you provide and who you provide them to. So the other big point I wanted to make is once you've identified who your ideal customer is, they may not be findable online. So my very simple example of this is I sell socks. And the ideal customer is someone with a hole in their sock. Well, you cannot find people with holes in their sock online. The reason why is because people don't talk about having holes in their socks on Facebook. They don't have groups of people who are people with holes in socks groups. Uh, it sounds trivial, but I can't tell you how many people try to market to groups that are not findable online. So just remember the hole in the sock and make sure that your ideal customer is not being defined by likes and interests that aren't really findable online. You want to see if you can't find a proxy for that. So if you want to find people with holes in their sock, you say, well, what type of person gets a hole in their sock? Well, runners do, dancers do. Okay, well, let's go find runners and dancers then. Hmm. That's much more findable. And there's no theory. You just have to do this in practice. You have to go into Facebook's business manager and look in audience insights in which, which audiences are available and findable and then go from there. Hmm. And, and, and then, uh, that's great. And I, I was going to ask you, because I, I see that when you're talking about a consumer product, when you're talking more about a service, maybe for business, are, are those users still findable in Facebook? Is Facebook the, the right channel? Or, or you would say that you have to you know, go more towards LinkedIn or other channels? Yeah. So one of the big misconceptions that people make about Facebook versus LinkedIn is that Facebook is B2C and LinkedIn is B2B. Mm -hmm. And so I ask you then why, if that's the case, right? And the reason why is because when people are on Facebook, they're sharing pictures of their dogs or their mm -hmm. grandkids. And so you, you, I would ask you, well, then why does GoDaddy advertise during the Super Bowl? GoDaddy mm -hmm. is a B2B business. They provide domain services, yet they find it profitable to spend a couple million dollars for a 30 second spot in the Super Bowl. When people are, it's seven o'clock on a Sunday night and they're eating nacho chips and, and guacamole. Mm -hmm. The reason that GoDaddy does that is because they understand that when you're a business owner, you never turn off. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're on Facebook sharing pictures of your grandkids or you're on LinkedIn checking out who's viewed your profile, the idea, the, the asset is the eyeball, right? Not the platform. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember when you're digital marketing, you're marketing to audiences, not on platforms. Facebook allows you to uh, advertise on Facebook, on Instagram, on Messenger, um, potentially in the future on WhatsApp, mm -hmm. and also in the uh, Facebook audience network, which is a set of thousands of affiliated mobile websites and mobile apps. So when you are advertising on Facebook, you're actually advertising across many, many different platforms. Where Facebook beats LinkedIn is the amount of insights that it has about its average user. Facebook knows more about its average user than LinkedIn. And so if you can find your ideal customer on Facebook, it can be an incredibly powerful and profitable marketing channel for you. Um, LinkedIn has about one third the number of users. 80% of people who are online in the United States are on Facebook, 25% are on LinkedIn. And so therefore, and the average user on Facebook is visiting eight times a day on average, on, you, on, on LinkedIn it's twice a week. Mm -hmm. So if the commodity is eyeballs, as long as you can get in front of the right customer, you absolutely wanna be on Facebook. My big message to any business is you must be on Facebook 
advertising and you must be in Google advertising. Mm -hmm. Facebook on social and Google on search are the essential places to be. And then if you're in B2B, you probably should also be playing in LinkedIn. And depending on what business you are, if you're a restaurant, you should probably be on Yelp. Hmm. You have to be on Yelp. Yeah. Um, a couple other free tools, just to go back to your other question. Um, so Facebook offers an amazing uh, way to access insights about the psychographics and demographics of your ideal customer across all 3 billion of its users. It's called um, Facebook Insights, Audience Insights, Facebook mm -hmm. Audience Insights, and it's free if you create a business manager account. It's an incredible tool and too few businesses use it. Google also has free tools that leverage their amazing set of data. Google's are Google Trends, trends.google.com, where you can see which search terms are getting searched more. Another one that's great is Google's Keyword Planner, which is inside of its ads manager. And there you can actually see, you put in one search term and it'll tell you other search terms that people who are doing that tend to use. Mm -hmm. um, another very cool free tool that all of us see all the time is when you're typing in google.com, you're typing in a search, you'll see they have suggested searches. Um, that's very, very helpful because that will help you with your content strategy in terms of knowing what other kinds of content you might want to create to capture users. So these are all ways in which you can get insight into your user, your ideal customer's psychographics and their search behavior. Awesome. And, and, and question then, because you talked about, um, you know, finding that ideal client and, and maybe it has some gut feeling, especially when uh, the companies that we work with, for example, they have maybe a, a defined ideal client in their home country, but then when they come to the U.S., it's like, okay, is it the same or not? Should I take this, you know, if, if I've been successful selling to financial institutions, then should I use that as our, as my ICP or not? And um, so, what would you say, I don't know if you have any advice for, for them in terms of uh, defining and, and validating that ideal client profile now in the US? Yeah, so if you have a history of doing business in Latin America and you're moving into the US and you know who your ideal customer profiles are uh, in your home country, that would be where I would start in the United States is I would get in front of those customers, try to sell to them and then see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no, there's no, when you're a B2B company, there's no substitute for customer interviews. So just begin and, and you might consider rather than doing sales calls, you might mm -hmm. consider customer discovery interviews where you're, yeah. you're not actually trying to sell them. You're just trying to learn about them. This is more of a, a design thinking approach mm -hmm. to learning your customer, but that would probably be what I would recommend when you're in the market entry phase. Awesome. And, then, yeah. and then once you've tailored your product to the American persona, the American equivalent of your ideal customer, that's when you'll start to see if you're going to get traction in your sales interviews. Awesome. You know, that, that's funny that you say it because we, we do have a program that is called market validation. And it's about that mainly. So it's about defining if the business model you have home replicates exactly the same in the US or what we have to tweak. And then it's just getting in front of people and actually pitching and, and saying, hey, does this make sense or not? What would you change and what? And it's not a, a sales uh, meeting. It's more like that. It's, it's validation and interview. So also and one, one, one other thing I would say is go into Facebook Audience Insights and find your ideal customer in there and then change the geographical targeting from your home country to the United States. And that will help you build out the American version of that persona. I'll give you an example. One of my clients is a mosquito control company, right? Mm -hmm. So they sell outdoor mosquito repellent services. Now, one of their ideal customers is the person who, the, the dad who loves to barbecue. But the, but the likes and interests of the barbecuing dad is very different in South Florida than it is in South Texas. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the dad in South Florida, like salsa and merengue, the, da, the same barbecuing dad in Texas loves country music. So their political affiliation might be different. They might be totally different, but they both love barbecuing. So when you change geography, you need to change your targeting, even if it's the same persona. 
Yeah, especially in the U.S., uh, there's such a wide variety of uh, cultures and, and ways of thinking and acting, right? So awesome. Okay, and then thanks. I, I don't want to take a lot more of your time. It's been awesome. But one last question that I always ask is, if you had to give one recommendation to a Latin entrepreneur that is coming to the U.S., uh, what would that be? Um, so my one recommendation, I think, when um, entering the U.S. market is to really narrow your product offering and narrow your target audience to your most irresistible, the lowest hanging fruit. In other words, start small, start narrow, start with your proven product, start with something that's differentiated from what's inside of the U.S. market. Um, and, and, and really lead with that. Um, and in combination, get really good at talking about why you do what you do. So you want to make sure that you're uh, really good at articulating your business story, because your business story will differentiate you from the competition without you having to spend a cent. So try to find a Uh, an audience and an offer that's the lowest hanging fruit that you know you can give them something they can't find anywhere else. And then be sure to tell the story of that product and that offering in a way that is uh, compelling and talks about your motivations for why you do what you do. Awesome. Awesome. Th thanks. And, and I love that you focus on the why because I think it's, it's what drives real businesses today. So absolutely. Um, Thanks, thanks so much for the time, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye.